Hi everyone, my name is Julie McCurry and this video is part five of the unit one series biological basis of behavior for AP psychology students and this video focuses on parts of the brain. I wanted to begin by putting this video into context. You can see all of the topics of unit one listed here on the screen and notice that the brain makes up part 1.4. This will cover about three videos in our series. Today's video will just focus on the structures of the brain. And notice that today's key focus question is, what are the structures that make up the parts of the brain and what are their functions? These are the essential concepts that will be covered in today's video lesson. By the end, you will be able to describe each of these parts as well as where they're located and their functions. So we can divide the brain into regions and these regions just help us better explain the location of the structures of the brain. The regions themselves are not parts, but just general descriptions of where we can find each of the structures. I'll start with the image on the end here that says the hindbrain. Different parts that are located in the hindbrain are at the base or the bottom of the brain. The midbrain is in the center. This is the region that connects the upper parts of the brain to the lower parts of the brain. The forebrain is the region at the top, and this contains structures kind of towards the center that sit right above the midbrain, as well as that outer layer of the brain. So before talking about each of the parts of the brain, I wanted to share some ways you can interact with this material while learning about the structures. I have found that 2D diagrams that you find on textbook pages or on worksheets aren't very good at showing just exactly what each of the structures looks like. And I found that three-dimensional interactive brain apps or websites can better depict the proportions of the structures as well as their shapes and sizes relative to the other parts of the brain. So for the rest of the video, I'll use a three-dimensional rendition of the brain that comes from a website called G2C Online. You can see it's that first um, image on the screen there. But there are lots of fantastic websites and apps that allow you to isolate the individual parts and then view, view them from different angles. And I found sometimes students really benefit from opening up a website on their device or an app on their device and to use that in um, coordination with watching these video notes so that students can then like manipulate the brain and look at it from different angles on their own while they're listening to an explanation of the part. And I have included some other resources here that I have found helpful. Throughout the rest of the video, students can check the blue text box. This will help you see what the College Board expects students to know about each structure. I will also use the 3D model from G2C online, and you can see that on the screen. It will allow you to see the specific parts I'll be referring to. During this portion of the notes, I'll describe each of the structures starting with the hindbrain. Illuminated on our diagram is the brainstem. It's located at the base of the brain. The brainstem sits just on top of the spine column and it's responsible for our body's most essential functions. The medulla oblongata is the part at the very bottom of the brainstem. It's located just above the spinal cord and it's depicted in pink on the screen. It looks a little bit like a small ice cream cone shaped structure and it's at the very lowest portion of the brainstem. The medulla oblongata is responsible for controlling our body's automatic functions that are necessary for survival. Things like heart rate, breathing and blood pressure. It also coordinates some of our reflexes like swallowing, coughing and sneezing. The medulla is essential for keeping us alive and it manages our critical functions that we don't even have to think about. Next structure is the pons and it's actually not mentioned by name in the CED for, mentioned by the College Board, um, but I'll go ahead and just briefly touch on it. I've italicized it so you know that it's not an essential concept, but I felt that it was just worth noting here. The pons is a little bit like, it looks like an Adam's apple on a throat or the curved part of the letter P. And it's responsible for the unconscious processes, things like sleep and wake cycles. The reticular activating system is a tiny bundle of nerve fibers that runs through the inside of the brainstem. And in our diagram here, you actually can't see it. It's not visible here on our 3D version, but it runs inside of the brainstem. And it's kind of like a tiny tube-like bundle of nerve fibers and the reticular activating system includes neurons that are sending projections up to the cerebral cortex that influences our level of consciousness. You can think of it a little bit like maintaining the alert, conscious, 
awake type of functions that make us responsive to our environment. A really great example of this is how medical researchers stimulated, electrically stimulated the reticular activating system of a cat. And what they found was when these researchers stimulated the reticular activating system without damaging any sensory pathways nearby, the cat lapsed into a coma and it never awoke. So this helps us understand the reticular activating systems function in our consciousness. Now, the most important takeaway here is that the structures within the brainstem are important for our most essential functions, functions that are necessary for survival and for life. The next structure in the hindbrain is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is located underneath the backside of the brain and it sits back behind the brainstem. It actually looks like a seat that the wrinkly part of the brain is sitting on top of. The cerebellum is about the size of a fist and it's referred to as the little brain. The cerebellum is crucial for coordinating voluntary movements, balance, and posture. It helps fine tune motor activities, ensuring that our movements are smooth and precise. The cerebellum also plays a role in learning motor skills like riding a bike, playing a musical instrument, and helping store and refine those learned patterns of movements. So next we're going to move into the forebrain. We're actually going to skip the midbrain because there's not necessarily a structure in that central portion of the midbrain that connects the forebrain to the hindbrain that you need to be aware of or know. So the next concept is the thalamus and the thalamus is a set of egg-shaped structures that are located really deep within the brain. They sit at the center just above the brainstem and the thalamus acts like a relay system. It takes the sensory information that comes from your sensory organs and then sends it to the appropriate areas of the brain for interpretation. For example, when you see, hear, or touch something, the sensory information is going first to the thalamus, which then directs it to the correct part of the brain to be understood. The thalamus also plays a role in regulating sleep, alertness, and consciousness, and helps us stay awake and aware of our surroundings. The limbic system is a complex set of structures located deep within the brain. It encircles the top of the brainstem and includes parts like the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. It creates a, a sort of ring-like curved formation. On my screen, you can see there are two green arm-like structures. These are the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory formation, specifically consolidating long-term memories, which makes it essential for our learning and retention of information. Next are the two blue almond shaped structures on the ends of the hippocampus and these are the amygdala. The amygdala processes basic primitive emotions like fear, aggression, and pleasure. The amygdala helps us recognize and react to emotionally charged situations, like feeling scared in a dangerous situation. It also influences memory formation, particularly emotionally charged memories, so that we remember those significant experiences in the next time, which would be important for our survival. Finally, on my screen, the hypothalamus is located at the very center. It looks a little bit maroon-like and is triangular in shape. This structure is responsible for some of our most basic drives, things like hunger, thirst, body temperature, and the hypothalamus is the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system through its control of the pituitary gland, which affects things like growth, metabolism, stress responses, and overall the hypothalamus maintains the body's internal balance and homeostasis. So the limbic system as a whole together plays a key role in how we experience and respond to the world emotionally and behaviorally. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. It covers many of the structures that we have covered so far. It is what you look at and you see the wrinkly, large folded surface. That's the cerebrum. And it covers up the limbic system and the thalamus and the brainstem. It's what's sitting on top of the cerebellum. The cerebrum is responsible for higher brain functions, things like thinking, 
and reasoning and planning and problem solving. It also processes our sensory information, the things that we see and hear and touch. And this outer layer of the cerebrum is also known as the cerebral cortex. This is where all of those con complex functions are taking place. And it's where we are processing how we interact with the world. In the next video, I will go into much more depth about the cerebral cortex and all of the association areas that cover the outer layer of the brain. Next is the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a thick band of nerve fibers that connects the right hemisphere of the cerebrum to the left hemisphere of the cerebrum. It looks like a broad curved like structure that runs from the front to the back and it lies just beneath the surface of the cerebral cortex. Its main role is to allow the communication between the two halves of the brain, and it enables them to share information and work together. This connection helps coordinate complex functions like movement, language, and problem solving by integrating the different types of processing that happens in each hemisphere. The last structure is the pituitary gland, which is a small pea-sized structure. It's located just below the hypothalamus and underneath the front part of the cerebrum. It looks like a tiny round protrusion that's hanging down underneath the cerebrum. The pituitary gland is often called the master gland of the endocrine system because it produces and releases hormones that control the other glands in the endocrine system, such as the the thyroid gland and the adrenal glands. And these hormones regulate functions like growth, metabolism, stress responses, and reproductive processes. The pituitary gland works very closely with the hypothalamus to maintain the body's hormonal balance and overall homeostasis. So let's finish today's video with a few review questions. Remember, as we've done in the past, I'll read the questions out loud and you'll need to pause to determine the answer. I will include the correct answers at the very end of the video displayed on the last slide. Question number one says, damage to which of the following brain structures would affect the processing of new explicit memories? Question number two says, damage to which of the following puts a person's life in the most danger because it may cause breathing to stop? Question number three says, a gymnast falls and hits her head on the floor. She attempts to continue practicing, but has trouble maintaining balance. What part of her brain has probably been affected? And question number five says, Brennan feels hungry. Which brain part is most responsible for his hunger? So this concludes today's video, part five, parts of the brain from the unit one series on biological basis of behavior for AP psychology students. I've listed the answers to the review multiple choice questions, but also make sure that you can answer today's key focus question and define our essential concepts from today's video.